the first place of inquiry is, you know, we sense, like, what are the ways that we get identified? Well, we get identified with our bodies. When it's painful, we say, I have a painful body, I am feeling the victim of pain, something's wrong with me and my body. We get identified with the body. We get identified with the way our body looks deeply in this culture, very identified. So the first reflection for us is if you just, and you can, if it helps, close your eyes just to sense this, is to sense where you might find that there's strong wanting or fearing around your bodily self. Where are you very attached? Where are you wanting things to be different? Where are you very aversive? And it may be with your sensory experience or it may be your appearance. For many it has to do with weight. Just sense where that is for you. And let yourself contact the realness of the experience. I like this, I don't like this. And see if you can sense that that realness, that aversion or that wanting, just see if it can be received or felt in awareness. You're sensing this background awakeness, the witness, some people call it the witness, that you're experiencing the pleasant or unpleasant, the aversion, the wanting. It's being felt, the felt sense is in awareness. And just ask yourself, Is this body what I really am? Is this body, this sense of a a self that looks this way, is that what I really am? Can you sense the pleasant or unpleasant, the aversion, the wanting, as aliveness that's playing in the field of awareness. So you can sense the enlarged being that's also here. Can you sense resting in the background, like sensing that awareness and just resting it and letting the storyline and the wants and the fears play, letting them be there, but resting in something larger. Is this body what I really am? Are these sensations, these fears, these wants? And we move into identification with emotion here and you might sense either this, what you're already paying attention to, or if there's some strong emotion in your life right now that seems to take over a lot. Anger, fear, grief, shame. If there's a situation that arouses the emotion, just to touch in a little right now. If there's something going on in your life, See if you can let yourself tap in and feel it. Can this be felt with a kind, open awareness? And then the inquiry, are these emotions what I really am? You can bring to mind a role that you play that you're very identified with. 
father, mother, sister, brother, boss, employee, artist, healer, spiritual person, unspiritual person, just a sense of role. And again, we're not, go, we're not taking a whole lot of time on each, just to give you the flavor, the, sense the storyline, your narrative, you in that role, the images that come with it, maybe some of the feelings, the self-sense that collects around that role. Is this who I really am? Now sense a belief you have that you know gets you in trouble. It may be a belief that I'm failing right now or I'm going to fail or uh, I'm too aggressive or uh, people don't like me or I'll never really be close to anyone or if I don't work really hard uh, I'll end up not being accepted or I'll never get what I want. See if you have a belief that you know is floating around in there. And for now, and you can keep on looking for a belief as I, I'm going to invite you to, if you'd like, open your eyes. I'm going to speak a little more about beliefs because our beliefs are where we get most identified and they're the ones that are the most challenging to untangle. We're often not aware of the beliefs. We're not aware that we're moving through the day but on some level we have the belief that I'm falling short. Or we're with another person and we have the belief that if they really knew me they wouldn't like me. We're not aware of them so much. Um, We're not aware that we're sensing in some way a powerlessness, like I can never really make a difference. Um, So, if you asked, if I asked you the question, if you landed on a belief just now, like I'm intrinsically unlovable or I'm flawed or whatever it is, and I said to you, um, is that belief really who you are? You might say, yep, (laughs) it is. I mean, that feels very real. And, um, that's, that's me, you know, I am unlovable, I am an unlovable person, or I am a failure. If there's a strong belief, it feel, it's very, very sticky. If it wasn't sticky, we wouldn't suffer. Okay, does that resonate? If it's sticky, we identify with it and we suffer. And um, so there's, you know, Mullah Nasruddin is a Sufi saint and fool and he has all these teaching stories and in one of them he goes into a bank and the manager says, well, can you please identify yourself? So he pulls out a little mirror and looks and goes, yep, that's me, all right. <laughs> you know? so, so this is our identity. These beliefs really shape our sense of who we are and it takes a real commitment to inquire and, att- and, and, and attend to them, to begin to loosen them so the light can shine through them, because we take them as true. And I've used this phrase now the last few weeks, because Sokni Rinpoche introduced me to it, and I think it's great. They are real but not true. Your belief, whatever it is that's keeping you in a small sense of self, it's a real belief in the sense that it exists, it comes up, and it brings up real feelings, but it's not truth. There's no way a belief can capture the truth of what you are. It obscures it. And anything that obscures who we are needs to be investigated, it needs the light of awareness shined on it. So, we begin to look. Well, I'll share one story. One student actually was a retreat, one of the retreats we did here, and his belief was, I'm like my father. And that was the belief. And he said, I'll always push and try and I'll really never get anywhere. Because his father just never made it according to his own standards. And he had the same feeling, that he was destined to not really make it. And so we, I had him get in touch with those feelings, but I, I first asked the question, is that true, that you'll never make it? And he said, 
it feels real. It feels real. But then he said, I don't know. It feels real, but I don't know. To right away ask, is this belief true, is really helpful. This is really true. And, and the reason it's helpful is you might say yes, but just having the question in there opens up a little space of awareness so you're not just automatically assuming it's true. There's still a question in there. The question's powerful. So when you hit that belief, just say, is it true? And then what I had, to, had him do is just ask him, what's it like to live with this belief? So he tried it on, it didn't take much, and he said, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to live with it, and it's depressing. It's like, I have no future to trust. And he described himself like Sisyphus. He just felt like he was pushing and pushing, the, you know, the king of Corinth, who had a, he was condemned by the god of Hades, Hades to uh, take that boulder and push it and push it and push it up the hill, and then it would just thum, tumble down, and then he had to push and push and push, and it would tumble. That's how he felt his life was. He was just pushing, and then it would fall down, and he'd have to push again. So exhausting made a lot of sense. So then I had him feel that and I said, who would you be? What would your life be like if you weren't believing that? Just for a moment, just sense that. And it was like he had let the boulder fall and he just was like that. He said, light. I wouldn't be pushing. Light, open, free, energy. To challenge a belief is to begin to bring attention to it. And it just needs attention because the wisdom in us, our deep wisdom knows that a belief is made out of fear and it doesn't represent the truth. But we are so, we've got so many mind moments of our conditioning believing it that it needs the light of awareness. Now, thus far, I've been talking about inquiring into but if at some point we don't inquire and then just relax, we don't actually end up inhabiting the truth of what we are. There's a wonderful story about uh, Ananda, who is the Buddha's uh, devotee and right-hand man and so on. He was, uh, he was always, he was the attendant and it was always by the Buddha's side. And he was also his cousin and very devoted. But after the Buddha's death, he, had, he wasn't yet enlightened, so at, there was this big council that was held after the Buddha's death, and only arahats who were enlightened were allowed to come. And up until that point, Ananda hadn't, hadn't awakened in that way. And so the night before the meeting, he committed himself to practicing really vigorously. Like he was gonna, he was gonna go for it. And so he, um, all night, he was just, you know, trying to pay attention and trying to break through and so on. And he just got exhausted and discouraged. And so finally, right before dawn, a lot happens right before dawn in these myths, you know. Right before dawn, he, he just gave up. He just said, you know, he, he just kind of lay back on his pillow and in the moment, of giving up the effort and lying back, that backward step, he was free. So the message is not that we shouldn't make an effort towards cultivating a wise attention. There are many ways that it's very skillful to develop some concentration and to inquire. These are all, they all take some effort. But if we don't have the wisdom that knows how to just let it all go. You know, make the effort, see more clearly, get more lucid, but then relax. We're unable to really inhabit what we discover. I'm going to read you uh, a short quote from Adyashanti because uh, in a way I hope this is a warm-up towards uh, what he shares next week. He says, don't try to hold on to what is realized, be what is realized. You cannot maintain realization or sustain it. In order for it to always be, you must be it yourself in your humanity. So we relax back and inhabit this awareness that's here, but we live it through our humanity. This isn't about becoming some 
you know, luminous space out there and saying, oh, no more with that body-mind, you know, I'm done with that. This is experiencing this life as animated by spirit, living, living a life from spirit through these body-minds. Maybe uh, we'll be closing in a few moments with another reflection, but one of the understandings I found is really useful is sensing that we usually have this notion that I'm a human on a spiritual path. And if we can flip it and say, I am, what I am is this awareness, this spirit that's waking up through this human incarnation. Then we get a little bit of a taste that what we are is that ocean and, we're, and it's like the wave is happening and we're discovering our oceanness through these bodies, discovering that spirit as we move through our life. There's uh, one last story I'd like to share with you and then we'll, we'll practice a little. And this is, this to me, it's a story about Thich Nhat Hanh and he basically shares how his mother's death devastated him. He said, the day my mother died, I wrote in my journal, a serious misfortune of my life has arrived. I suffered for more than one year after passing away of my mother. But one night in the highlands of Vietnam, I was sleeping in the hut in my hermitage. I dreamed of my mother. I saw myself sitting with her and we were having a wonderful talk. She looked young and beautiful, her hair flowing down. It was so pleasant to sit there and talk to her as if she had never died. When I woke up, it was about two in the morning and I felt very strongly I had never lost my mother. The impression was that my mother was still with me, was very clear. I understood that the idea of having lost my mother was just an idea. It was obvious in that moment that my mother is always alive in me. I opened the door and went outside. The entire hillside was bathed in moonlight. It was a hill covered with tea plants and my hut was set behind the temple. Walking slowly in the moonlight, I noticed my mother was still with me. She was the moonlight caressing me as she had done so very often, very tender, very sweet. Each time my feet touched the earth, I knew my mother was there with me. I knew this body was not mine alone, but a living continuation of my mother and my father and my grandparents and great-grandparents, of all my ancestors. These feet that I saw as my feet were actually our feet. Together, my mother and I were leaving footprints in the damp soil. From that moment on, the idea that I'd lost my mother no longer existed. All I had to do was look at the palm of my hand and feel the breeze on my face or the earth under my feet to remember that my mother is always with me, available at any time. So I share that as a part of closing because there's a way in which we have to honor our humanness and grieve and let the fear be there and the hurts and the wants and the anger and they're real. Thich Nhat Hanh's grief was real. But there's a meaning we make out of things that's not true. And if we can begin to pause and honor the realness with great tenderness we can begin to relax back into that presence that's timeless and know who we are and not get caught in the trance. So for me, that's the meaning of interdependence day is in a way that we realize our belonging as vast, as boundless. And from that realization, our actions come, are naturally going to respond to each other with caring, with intelligence, with spontaneity. So let's, let's close with a little sitting. As you pause and close your eyes, just let yourself become aware of the life that's right here. Notice the aliveness in your body. It's 
sounds around you. Whatever might be going on in your heart right now, whatever mood, whatever feelings. And then also sense this background presence, this alert inner stillness that's aware of all the changing phenomena. You might look back and just say, what is aware right now? What is this awareness? Very gentle inquiry. What is this awareness? What is listening right now? Not a mental question. It's like you're turning and looking right into the awareness itself. And then just let go and relax. Just be it. Just rest in the sea of wakefulness. sensing how everything you experience is part of what you are. Sounds, sensations, feelings, space in the room. Rest in wakeful openness. We close with the simple prayer that we might wake up to realize this loving presence, this timeless presence that is our deepest nature and that our lives might be an expression of that, that all beings everywhere might awaken to realize the truth of who they are and discover the possibility of peace on earth, of healing, of freedom everywhere. Namaste.